Okay, here we are. Third uh, sub lecture on Apache Spark. It covers the directed acyclic graph technology and various libraries available, it, built in functions built on top of Spark. And um, we've already effectively mentioned some of these already, but uh, these are quite important. And again, this type of technology will be present in all other powerful programming environments of big data. Because it's very important to be able to specify a sequence of activities in a graph. And it's very important to have high performance or high and high functionality libraries available to do common things like word count or clustering or deep learning, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Well here we have our favorite data flow graphs. Here we are starting at one. Uh, then we do some action, we get two. That could be a map in, in RDD. Uh, then we do two, three different actions on two and produce four or three different uh, data sets, three, four, and five. There's a data set over here, RDD rather over here, which six, which also goes to five. Five takes uh, the results of two and five, produces, sends it off to four, four receives from two and three, and it finally produces seven. Which is the answer? Well, it's an RDD from which the answer can be obtained. So this is a generic, I mean, no, sorry, a general graph, which can be pretty, um, um, even much more complicated. Sometimes it's actually very simple. It's just a pipeline. One thing goes to another thing, goes to a third thing, and so on. We, we often run that in my group. Pipeline, most important. Uh, and simplest of the graphs, <coughs> four things in a row. And there is a DAG scheduler, which is uh, meant to take the input graph and find out how best to schedule it on nodes. That's not entirely trivial because each of these um, nodes will produce um, will run for different lengths of time. And we also have to remember where the data is, because presumably two is produces an RDDs. Well, so one produces an RDD, two nuts is another one which goes off to three, and so on. Um, and we can have any number of stages in the DAG. Um, and that's why, I mean, we, everything is a DAG. So that means that whatever you want to do, you can think of it as a DAG of a very general nature and allow, execute it as a single Spark job. And that's one reason to do this, because when you're doing workflow and you have lots of things put together, you don't want to by hand keep pushing the job. Thing. Mm, job number one has written this data to disk. Let's run job number two. Job number two has written this data to disk. Oh, no, it failed. Wow, they have rerun two. Now we produce an answer which worked from run three. That's too complicated. You have to automate the uh, linking of the jobs together, the fault tolerance, and everything. So. These are, this is a data flow graph or a DAG, and Spark has a good support for this. As in fact, do many other systems. NiFi has this, such a capability. Um, uh, Flink, uh, the European competitor, Spark also does this. Um, and it has to uh, have a layer, Python, or you know, Java or Scala. And then it has an operator graph of the operations to be performed. And then so we, do, we do transformations or actions. Um, and we have to do, do those uh, in a effective fashion. Remember they're down in a lazy evaluation. And um, also the scheduler is dynamic. We pointed that out already. And that allows you to accept things that depend on the Answer be of the calculated, and we obviously we get some answers. You might want to do one stage later on. If you get a different answer, you might do a different stage. Um, there is a task scheduler which arranges all these tasks because each 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 part of the graph has got to run in parallel. Has lots of tasks, so it's pretty complicated. And we have a cluster manager which is Mesos, so usually for Spark, but it can also be Kubernetes or even Yarn. Or it's even probably some user built-in tool with the Spark. And this cluster manager 
is not only to run the Spark job, but also the other jobs running on the, uh, the cluster, because Spark typically will share the cluster with other things. So here is a typical execution. We have a driver program, a Python code maybe, because you know, interpreted languages are particularly good for high level pro programs. We don't actually do any arithmetic, they just launch other programs. It's important to know that interpreted languages the interpreted overhead is only important if the computation is very fine grained and takes a short length of time. If the computation is a giant run clustering or run deep learning, then the fact that the driver is written in Python or even slower it, uh, interpreted language doesn't matter. So here we have um, the driver program that goes to the cluster manager. Um, over here we have the task graph manager, DAX scheduler, which um, looks and produces a graph between the various RDDs, generates tasks to execute these things. And then we have worker nodes, which have uh, executors on them, which run the different tasks. And this we saw this actually with Hadoop. So this general model of a set of demons or or monitoring programs running either associated with, with applications and associated with nodes. That is replicated in almost all running systems, whether it be MPI, Hadoop, Spark, or what have you. Here we come to the libraries, and we have these ones available with Spark, MLlib. We use it's effectively their version of Mahout. Spark streaming is their way of doing streaming. I've mentioned it's not. It's sort of adequate for some cases. It basically views streaming as a set of uh, batch jobs where each batch size is small. Uh, we have what used to be called Shark. We had an earlier slide on that. And we have the ability to link R to Spark, which is useful, but again, not terribly um, deep technology. And we can think of all these libraries as being hosted on top of the Spark overall environment, which is this DAG processor and the scheduler and the RDDs. They're sitting down here, RDD is down here. So all these core technologies are sitting here. And then your favorite nifty machine learning code, which is running like the support vector machine or something, it's sitting in MLlib. And if it's a graph algorithm, it's sitting in GraphX, which um, they support. Here we have the Spark SQL graph, which I said used to be called Shark. And it's like it's the equivalent of the time it was built, it was viewed as the equivalent of Hive for Hadoop with Shark for Spark. Um, and it just, um, it's actually, Hive came before uh, Spark is not all. I, well, as we told you, Spark ran 100 times faster than Hadoop. I don't think Spark SQL runs 100 times faster than Hive. Because Hive is an actively supported system. And there's no obvious reason why Hadoop should be terribly slow on basic database operations. MLlib, I believe, is a very famous system. It has a rather Difficult to use set of libraries, and it can be used in those library routines can be called in many different uh, master languages, because you, you want to do clustering from Java, clustering from Scala, clustering from R, clustering from Python. And the reason why it outperforms MapReduce is that it doesn't keep writing to disk. And if your algorithm is say like k-means or SVM is iterative, that's pretty important. Um, from the standard simple libraries, um, logistic regression and things like that, they're all in MLlib. Okay, here we are. This is a list of the algorithms in MLlib, machine learning library for Spark. We have basic classification algorithms here from logistic regression base through uh, random forests and things like that. We have recommended engines built around ALS, alternating least squares. We have clustering. 
K means is the most famous of these. Topic modeling, latent Riesling allocation, that's the sort of topic modeling to Jura. Uh, it's a very well done, very well thought through uh, approach. We have the ability to transform features, and we have the ability to do decomposition, uh, which eventually could lead to dimension reduction, principal component analysis, and singular value decomposition. These are basically, these are all matrix algebra. I mean, those are actually matrix algebra routines, not um, not really machine learning. 